Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava. And today I've got something completely different for you. In one of our previous videos, we have investigated and applied the Gauche model that can be used to study the time dynamics and persistence in the volatility of time series. And uh, usually it is applied using the maximum likelihood estimation and uh, for the distribution of errors of residual volatilities, you most of the time consider the normal distribution probability density function over here and it is a function of model parameters, and uh, it plugs in the values of realized volatility, epsilon t, and conditional volatility, vt, over here. But sometimes it is not the best probability density function to consider if your time series behaves not as well as uh, proxied by the normal distribution, it has fat tails or heavy tails even, than other distribution functions, such as Laplace distribution, student distribution, or even the generalized normal distribution, the error distribution, are better fits and can generate a better Gauche model. So today we're investigating just that. But to briefly recap what's going on with the baseline Gauche model, let me first guide you through the estimation process. So we have got four parameters of the Gauche model over here, and those are the constant, so the expected daily return, the unconditional variance that the volatility of the time series relaxes towards if there are no unexpected disturbances in the time series, and the Arsh and Gauche terms that define how persistent the time series is. And they go into this conditional variance equation over here, and it shows that the Arsh term alpha shows you how impactful an error term, a disturbance, is towards the conditional volatility in the next observation. So here it's the contribution of unexpected abnormal return disturbance in the previous trading day towards the volatility, the variance of return in the following day. And the Gauche term beta tells you how persistent the conditional variance is. So if the conditional variance in the previous day was higher, then beta shows you how much of this persistence is carried forward towards the next observation, towards the next trading day. And the realized variance epsilon t squared is just the sum of conditional variance vt squared and the variance of variance, the various disturbance term ut. And that's the distribution of this ut disturbance that is modeled by this density function that we consider for the maximum likelihood estimation. How can we estimate the goodness of fit, the degree to which our Gauche model approximates the real volatility process? Well, first of all, there is the log likelihood function, which is just the sum of the logs of the probability density function across all estimations over here. But also we can consider a more standard measure, which is the root mean squared error which can remind you of regular OLS estimations where you minimize the sum of squared deviations. So here we have got our volatilities as predicted by the Gauche model and as realized, so actually observed volatilities. And the root mean squared error just shows you what is the average squared deviation from the realized volatility as given by our Gauche model. And uh, obviously we could do both. We could either minimize our root mean squared error or maximize our log likelihood. But research shows that maximizing log likelihood generally gives you a more robust answer, a more robust result. How actually to implement the maximum likelihood estimation in Excel? Well, first of all, we have to calculate this uh, likelihood function or the log likelihood function to make it computationally more simple. And uh, here uh, I do just that, where I plug in the values of conditional variance and uh, the realized variance and translate this formula into the language of Excel. 
and uh, for numerical optimization we can use the solver function and plug in the function that we want to maximize and the variables that we need to change. So here our objective function is the log likelihood and we want to maximize it by changing the variable cells that correspond to gosh parameters the constant, the unconditional variance, and the persistence parameters, the arch alpha and the gosh beta. And we actually don't want to make any constraints on these parameters, as we have cleverly accounted for that. And how did we do it? I'll show you just in a moment when we run the estimation. Here we can select the gradient descent method and click solve and see if our model arrives at the optimal parameters of alpha and beta. We see that our log likelihood slowly approaches the optimal value and we see that our arch is around 0.2 and our gosh is around 0.74 and we can see how our uh, realized volatility and our gosh predicted volatility interact we see that it's quite a decent fit and we roughly match the peaks that are pronounced there in the data but how did we manage to optimize it using gradient descent without introducing any additional constraints on our variables, because we all know that, for example, our unconditional variance should be strictly positive, our arch and gar should be both non-negative and strictly less than one, and the sum of those two should be less than one for the process to converge. Well, there is a cool trick that one can implement in the log likelihood function by introducing the if error function over here and uh, returning a very high in magnitude negative number if there is an error over here. So if something doesn't converge or if the formula returns an error for some other reason, then you just return a so high negative number that the log likelihood is so small that the procedure then tries to eliminate this error. So that's how you can tell solver to eliminate the problem and arrive at the restrictions and the optimal values of parameters on its own. So it is just a clever trick to ease your life and simplify the calculations. And here we can see that the root mean squared error that started at around 0.67% is actually quite decently reduced to 0.61%. But can we do better by applying other uh, error distribution functions? Well, first of all, let's consider the easiest one, the Laplace distribution, which has uh, slightly heavier tails than the normal distribution function and actually is represented with a simpler functional form. So it's good for a change. Here we have got this Laplace probability density function represented as an Excel formula and we still do the same trick to make uh, solver converge without uh, returning an error if our model's parameters behave wildly. And now we can just click solver and specify this uh, optimization task by maximizing the likelihood and changing our gosh model variables constant omega alpha and beta and we need to untick this box to allow our constant for example to be negative and we can click solve and wait until the convergence algorithm arrives at an optimal value of log likelihood and we can see that with the Laplace distribution our log likelihood is actually quite a bit higher than the one uh, we arrived at using the normal distribution and uh, what is perhaps even more important is that our root mean squared error has significantly reduced. Our alpha and beta are quite a bit different than the ones we arrived at here with uh, the impact of conditional volatility persistence being more important in the Laplace model than the impact of immediate uh, random return disturbance impact because the alpha for Arsh model is lower here, twice as low actually, while gosh is marginally higher. And if we compare the dynamics of our conditional variance over here, our conditional volatility in orange with the dynamics over here, we can actually see that the unconditional variance, the value of volatility it tends towards when there are no disturbances, is lower in the Laplace model. And it actually can be shown over here with this cell computing the value of the long run volatility. For the normal distribution it's 0.91 and for the Laplace model it's 0.36. Much much lower. And that shows you how assuming a correct distribution for your 
error term can lead to a drastically different estimation result that allows you to model the dynamics of volatility with a lower error. But can we do even better than that? Maybe the errors, the residuals, are distributed even with a fatter tail distribution. Maybe we need to allow some extra flexibility. As you all know, the normal distribution has a courtesy of zero, and uh, the Laplace distribution has a courtesy of three. Maybe we need to allow the courtesies to vary to account for various possibilities, various uh, heaviness of tails. So to do that, we can use either the student distribution or the generalized normal distribution or the error distribution. So let's start with student. And here, what is different, and you can spot it almost immediately, I guess, is that we have got an additional parameter that goes into our log likelihood function. This parameter is the number of the degrees of freedom for the student distribution, and it is basically the shape parameter that tells you how fat the tails of the distributions are. If the number of the degrees of freedom increases, the distribution becomes more and more well-behaved and closer and closer to normal. That is very typical of the student distribution, and that's the intuition that uh, all of us use when doing hypothesis testing with the student's t-distribution. But here we're only concerned with the shape. So we need to know how fat and how uh, prominent the extreme values are in terms of our volatility. So what is the optimal value of the degrees of freedom and uh, what are the optimal parameters of the Gauche model that correspond to this optimal value? And here we can utilize various strategies. You can either pre-estimate this shape parameter using the distribution of your returns, and that's what we did in the video on student's t-distribution quite a while ago, so please check this out if you're interested. Or you can allow it to vary alongside your Gauche model parameters to optimize everything in one go. So let's show both examples. First of all, let's assume that this value of the degrees of freedom we arrived at in the previous video remains fixed, and we'll just vary the Gauche model parameters. To do that, we can need to go to Solver, select our log likelihood function to maximize, and change the variable cells that correspond to the Gauche model parameters only. So just as we did in the previous example, we untick the box, uh, allowing the constant to be negative, and we click Solve to arrive at an optimal value of log likelihood. And we have just arrived at an optimal value. We can see that uh, our model has converged to a quite high value of log likelihood, which is marginally higher than the one we got in Laplace. And uh, our uh, alpha and beta are comparable to the ones we obtained in the previous example, but both are slightly higher, corresponding to higher persistence of variance with long-run volatility being uh, a little bit higher than in the Laplace case. Quite notably, our root mean squared error is actually higher in case of student than in case of the Laplace, but the difference is marginal. So it signals that marginal differences in log likelihood and or root mean squared error can occur in similar distribution functions, and uh, it's not necessarily the case that if one increases, the other decreases, and vice versa. However, we haven't checked what would happen if we allow the degrees of freedom parameter, the shape parameter of our distribution of errors to vary alongside the uh, Gauche model parameters. So let's start with the baseline case, setting all of the values back to their starting baseline parameters and re-specifying our solo function to allow for the number of the degrees of freedom to vary as well. And here we can see that our log likelihood has arrived at a quite comparable uh, magnitude. Our Arsh and Gash parameters are still quite similar, but our number of the degrees of freedom has been reduced from 5.57 to 4.71. Still not a massive decrease, but a considerable decrease nonetheless, with our root mean squared error uh, reducing a little bit. So it actually signals that if you estimate the degrees of freedom uh, prior to estimating the Gauche model or allowing it to vary alongside your Gauche model parameters, the results would not change much. Again, the best practice would be to look at both models and see which fits data the best. And the final distribution that we'll consider today is the generalized normal distribution or the error distribution that is characterized by this pretty 
a probability density function here that actually generalizes over the normal distribution as the title suggests with this shape parameter gamma uh, representing the fatness of tails. The lower the gamma parameter is, the fatter the tails are. And it's quite easy to note that if gamma is equal to 2, we have got the default case that our distribution is just normal, and if it's equal to 1, the function will spit out the Laplace probability density function. So actually, this function generalizes over two of the previous cases we have already investigated. So it cannot really return anything worse than those two, isn't it? So we can see here whether this approach would give us the best result. And uh, just as with the student distribution with the shape parameter, the degrees of freedom, here the shape parameter gamma can be either estimated prior to our Garsh model calibration, and we have actually estimated this uh, shape parameter in our video on the error distribution, so check this out if you're interested, and we'll show both approaches again. So first of all, we need to go to solve and specify our task. We need to maximize log likelihood by changing first just the model parameters, unticking this to allow our constant to be negative, and clicking solve. And here we see that our log likelihood is actually slightly smaller than the one we arrived at for the Laplace distribution, primarily because we have fixed this parameter. Perhaps a variation uh, of this parameter will help us achieve a better fit. However, still, our root mean squid error is very comparable to the ones we obtained for Laplace and student, and massively lower than the one we obtained for the normal distribution. So that's a good sign nonetheless. So here we need to return to our baseline case by setting the starting values of our parameters. So now we can go to solver and respecify our task to maximize log likelihood again and allowing the shape parameter gamma to vary alongside other variables as well. And here we see that the value of the log likelihood for the error distribution for the generalized normal distribution is the highest we have obtained so far, which is unsurprising given that this distribution is less restrictive than Laplace. However, this improvement in log likelihood, again, doesn't show us any improvement in root mean squared error. However, if you look at all three sophisticated heavy tail distribution we have applied so far, they are all very similar among each other and all achieve tremendous improvements over the baseline case with the normal distribution. So what can we learn from these examples? Well, first of all, sometimes your error distribution, the distribution of residuals, does not follow the normality assumption, and then using some heavy-tailed or fat-tailed distribution can generate you better results. However, there are many various techniques that you can use when specifying this particular heavy-tailed distribution, and uh, all of those approaches are remarkably similar in terms of both log likelihood and uh, the root mean squared error. So do choose wisely, do play around with the assumptions, and uh, some of your trials will get you a decent result. And that's all there is for estimating the Gauche model with the various distributional assumptions of the error function. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions on videos for business, economics, or finance you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.